good evening everyone uh, welcome to the next edition of image journal club today cmc ludhiana will be hosting the hote try the pre plan analysis on the cytogenetic classification and risk stratification for the patients who have received carfilzomib and today we have our uh, final year resident dr pavitra who will be presenting the journal to you Oh, good evening, everyone. I would like to thank Image Society for giving me an opportunity to present this journal club. Uh, the journal which I'll be presenting today is Carfilzomib Induction, Consolidation and Maintenance with or Without Autologous Stem Cell Transplantation in Newly Diagnosed Multiple Myeloma Patients, a pre-planned cytogenetic subgroup analysis of the randomized Phase two Forte trial. So it was an Italian study. It was published in Lancet Oncology in January 2023. Uh, so coming on to the deep picots CRPS. So this is a mnemonic we use initially to... Um, look at what type of a study it is, what was the population intervention and all. Picots, we all know, so we added a few more things for our better understanding. So coming on to the design of the study, it was a randomized control study, which was done in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patient, with the intervention being KRD ACT with KRD and KCD ACT. There were two comparators. There was comparator one was KCD, KRD induction consolidation with or without transplantation and the comparator two was the second arm that is KR and arm maintenance. The outcome was, so this was the outcome of the initial Forte trial which was published. So there was, there's no separate outcome which is mentioned in this paper. So it is VGPR after induction with KRD versus KCD and PFS with KR versus arm maintenance. The duration of the study was two or three months. It was done as a hospital setting and the Checklist we use for a randomized cons uh, trial is called CONSORT and the risk of bias will be assessed during risk of bias 2 tool. The pharmacoeconomics and so what will be dealt by Dr. Joseph John. Coming on to the introduction, the prognosis of patients with multiple myeloma is greatly affected by the presence of high-risk cytogenetic abnormalities. PFS and OS in patients with high-risk multiple myeloma are shorter than those in patients with standard risk disease. Bortezomib-based versus non-bortezomib-based induction after AACT, the median PFS was 32 months versus 22 months with a significant p-value. In a relapse setting, KRD or Ixazomib uh, reduce the risk of progression or death in high-risk patients compared with the lenalidomide and dexamethasone alone. So this study basically reports a pre-planned analysis to assess the effect on the outcomes uh, in Forte trial to compare the efficacy of the different induction, intensification, and consolidation regimens, as well as maintenance strategies tested in a Forte trial according to cytogenetic risk status. So this is basically another paper which is done from the initial Forte trial where they have already planned that they'll be doing the uh, cytogenetic analysis later. Coming on to the methods, so it was a randomized open-label phase two trial where 42 Italian academic and community practice centers uh, were included. These are the inclusion and the exclusion criteria. The inclusion criteria were transplant eligible newly diagnosed patients who are aged between 18 to 65 years, who are symptomatic MRD positive according to IMWG criteria with a performance series of 60% or higher, who had adequate bone marrow function as defined uh, with CREA clearance of 30 ml per uh, minute or greater with a good uh, left ventricular ejection fraction. And the exclusion criteria indicate, included peripheral neuropathy worse than grade 2 or grade 3 with pain, unstable angina, um, NIHA class 3 and 4 heart failure, grade 3 conduction defects, malignancies within the past three years, and known active viral infections. Coming on to the randomization, so this was the randomization which was done in the initial Forte trial. So there's, there's no separate randomization done for this because it was a uh, pre-planned subgroup analysis which was done. So it was a 1 is to 1 is to 1 randomization where it was a block randomization of 12 size stratified according to ISS and the age group that is less than 60 years and age between 60 to 65 years. The, so the, the first group include, included uh, KRD, next KRD which went on to without autologous and KRD with KCD. 
So next, the intensification. So after the induction of four cycles, they mobilized with, uh, for the first group was mobilized and they underwent an autologous stem cell transplantation with a 200 mg per meter square melphalan. The next group continued with the uh, KRD regimen for four more cycles and the KCD group also got melphalan 200 mg per meter square. Then these same group were consolidated with further, the first and the second group were consolidated further with four cycles of KRD and uh, the last group with four cycles of KCD. So there was a second randomization at this point before the maintenance, which was an 1 is to 1 randomization for KR and R. Here the dose of uh, carfilzomib was 50 mg per meter square IV once a daily on that is twice a month for up to two years. Uh, and in the lelodomidon, the regional intolerance. So initially did with the bi-weekly uh, carfilzomib, but later it was changed to weekly. Coming on to the cytogenetic risk which they use, so the high risk cytogenetic abnormalities which included was translocation 440, translocation 416, 17p deletion, deletion 1p and 1q gain and amplification. 1q gain was more than three copies and amplification was more than or equal to four copies. It's almost similar to the MSMART classification with few additions and deletions. So coming on to the disease assessment, so initially at the induction before starting or eight weeks within the starting of the first dose of carfilzomib, a radiological assessment was done either with MRI, PET-CT or X-ray skeletal survey and every yearly X-rays were done. And before starting the maintenance, that is pre-maintenance, there was an MRD done and every six monthly uh, MRD was done during the maintenance. This was done only in VG VGPR patients. Coming on to the primary and the secondary endpoints, the primary endpoints, as I said, it was the it was of the initial forte trial. That's the proportion of patients with at least a VGPR with KRD versus KCD as induction and progression-free survival from maintenance uh, randomization with KR versus R alone. And the secondary endpoints were uh, stringency R, ORR, MRD negativity, sustained MRD negativity, which was defined as uh, pre-maintenance MRD negative and if they continue to have MRD negativity for a year. So that was the definition of the MRD negativity, which was defined in the paper. The duration of response, time to progression, time to next treatment, PFS and OS and safety. So in this pre-plan analysis, the effect of high risk cytog uh, cytogenetic abnormality, it was 0, 1 and 2 plus. So basically what we say now as single hit, double hit was told as like no high, high risk cytogenetic abnormality, one or more than one two or equal to two, was investigated on PFS and OS in the following groups. That is the overall population, the three induction, intensification and consolidation groups, and the two maintenance groups. And PFS, OS, MRD negativity, sustained MRD negativities were compared. Coming on to the statistical analysis, for this pre-planned subgroup analysis, no formal power calculation were included in the protocol. So basically, the sample size was derived from the initial forte trial. There was no separate sample size calculation done for this study. For a more accurate interpretation of the results, because it was not powered to analyze, so a power analysis reporting the power curves of different numbers of the events and allocation ratios with the significance level of test at a conventional value of 0, 0.0, that is two-sided, was performed, and P was considered as less than 0.05%. Time to event data analysis was done by kaplan meyer methods and HRs were estimated by Cox proportional hazard model. Uh, so to assess whether the effect of cytogenic was modified by the treatment received models contained in HR groups and the interaction groups were fitted. The presence of the significant interaction was indicated effect modification in the absence of any significant interaction, simple additive models were fitted. A sensitivity analysis adopting a different cutoffs was used for deletion 17p. Now coming on to the results. Uh, so initially, 477 people were included in the study. After the in inclusion exclusion, at the first randomization, the KRD plus ACT had 132 patients, the KRD had 126, and KCD plus ACT had 138 patients, were almost similar in numbers. After the induction, when they started intensification, we had 188 patients. Uh, then, sorry, yeah. Uh, after that, we had second randomization where 292 randomly assigned patients were taken for maintenance. In that, 152 were in the lenidomide arm and 140 were in the carfilzomib and lenidomide arm. Uh, at the end, 52 85 were receiving maintenance in the len arm and 80 in the KR arm. So this is the uh, baseline uh, data of 
the patients. So almost age, sex, everything was matched. Most of the patients were in ISS stage two and RSS stage, uh, sorry, ISS stage one and RSS stage two. And the most common cytogenic abnormality which was seen was gain one P. And most of the patients were in zero high risk cytogenic abnormality. That is, they didn't have any high risk cytogenic abnormality. So amongst the 396 patients, almost 39% were in zero high risk cytogenic abnormality, 35 were in one, and 27 were had two or more cytogenic abnormality. Amongst the uh, 166 patients, 47, that is 31% of them had 0%. This is basically PFS and this is basically uh, death. So had a zero high risk cytogenic abnormality and 41% had uh, one and 60% had two or more. The median duration of follow-up after the first randomization, that is after induction, intensification, and consolidation was almost uh, 51 months. And there was no significant interaction between the groups and treatment over the PFS and OS after the first randomization. Coming on to the progression-free survival, the four-year progression-free survival from the first randomization. So in the zero... Uh, HRCA group, there was 71% PFS with the where the median PFS was not reached. In the one HRCA group, we had 60% PFS. There also the median PFS was not reached. And with two or more, it was 39% with the median PFS of 34%. So there was no significant difference in the PFS from the first randomization between patients with one HRCA or those with zero HRCA across the three arm, across induction, intensification, and consolidation. So the p-value is not significant. Whereas the patients with two or more HRCA had a higher risk of progression or death than did with the patients with zero. Basically here, they're trying to say that high risk people, the ones with double hit or more than that, did worse than the one who didn't have any cytogenic abnormality. So this is the chart which shows four-year PFS from the first randomization, three-year PFS uh, from the second randomization and the overall survival from first randomization. So if you see here in the four-year PFS, all patients, we see that there was some significant difference in the KRD, KRD alone or KCD with ASCT groups. Uh, the the p-value was significant here in all the patients. Even the three-year PFS after the second randomization, that is after the maintenance, there was difference in all the group. That's mainly seen in patients who had no cytogenic abnormality with who had more than two or high high risk cytogenic abnormality. The four-year OS from the first randomization was also showed similar thing. So if we see here, basically the patients who had high risk cytogenic, the difference was significant in patients who didn't have uh, versus the one who had uh, two or more high risk cytogenic abnormality. So these are the Kaplan-Meier curves, which is showing the uh, PFS after the first randomization where in the KRD uh, with the ACT hump, we can see that there was no significant difference after the first randomization amongst all the three groups. Whereas this is quite intriguing to see that just with the KRD arm, we see that there is some significant difference uh, between the people who didn't have any high risk cytogenic abnormality versus the one who had two or more. Coming on to the KCD with the ACT arm, here, there was significant difference in the PFS amongst the one who had two or more and with zero or one high risk cytogenic abnormality. So this is the second uh, randomization. That is basically, this is after the maintenance group where they randomized to LR and, uh, I mean, sorry, KR and R. So in the overall maintenance group, uh, again, if we see the people who had high risk cytogenic abnormality had did worse compared to the one who didn't have. In the carfilzomib and Lenam, sorry, in the carfilzomib and Lenam, there was no significant difference. So what they're trying to say is probably if we give carfilzomib, even the high risk cytogenic abnormality people will fairly do as much as the one who don't have cytogenic abnormality. In the lenidomide alone arm again, the high risk cytogenic abnormality group did worse. Coming on to the overall survival. So here, 18% uh, of the people died and that most of them were, that is 37% were in the patients who had high-risk cytogenic abnormality. So coming on to the four-year overall survival from the first randomization, uh, it was not reached amongst the people with zero or one, but it was 59% median OS. 
uh, in patient who had high risk cytogenic abnormality. So compared with the patients with uh, high risk cytogenic with zero high risk cytogenic abnormality, there was oops. They were significantly higher in the patients with one high risk cytogenic abnormality and two or more high risk cytogenic abnormality. A significantly higher risk of death was seen in patients with two or more high risk cytogenic abnormality than with one. So they have also done an MRD assessment, but this was a post hoc analysis which is mentioned in the original paper also. So the pre maintenance rates of minimal MRD negativity was more in patients who had uh, one high risk cytogenetic abnormality compared with uh, the one with zero or high. So uh, the one who had high risk obviously had uh, less uh, pre-maintenance rates of MRD negativity. So the rates of one year sustained MRD negativity were similar in the patients with zero and were lower in patients with two or more. Most of the patients with high risk cytogenic abnormality with one year sustained MRD negativity had only one high risk cytogenic abnormality and a lower frequency of uh, application 1Q. Also, patients with two or more high risk cytogenic abnormality had a higher risk of not sustaining MRD negativity or progression compared with patients who had zero and with patients with one. Patients with one also had a higher risk of not sustaining MRD negativity or progression compared to one with uh, zero. So basically, KRD plus ACT was associated with the higher rates of one-year sustained MRD negativity compared with uh, KRD alone or KCD plus ACT across all the subgroups. So the patients with one-year sustained MRD negativity had a similar PFS regardless of their cytogenetic risk, be it uh, 1, be it uh, 0, 1, or 2. So they had similar PFS. So these are the MRD negativity rates. So it is significantly the MRD negativity rate is more in the KRD arm alone. This we saw in the PFS also similar uh, or outcomes. And the sustained MRD negativity rate was more in the KRD plus ACT group. After the second randomization, the median duration of follow-up was 37 months. And here the pre three-year PFS after the second randomization, that is after the maintenance, uh, was not reached in both zero and one high risk abnormality group, whereas it was 50, it, sorry, it, whereas it was 40 in two or more. Higher risk of progression or death was seen in patients with uh, one high risk cytogenic abnormality than with zero. The risk of progression or death did not significantly difference be differ between the patients with two or more cytogenic abnormality compared with one. So this was again a post hoc. They used the RISs. So across all the groups, patients with intermediate low risk and uh, had similar PFS to patients at low risk, patients with intermediate high risk and high risk disease still had an inferior PFS. Coming on to the discussion of the study, carfilzomib based triplet regimen with or without ACT as upfront treatment for patients with uh, newly diagnosed multiple myeloma resulted in similar four-year PFS and sustained MRD negativity rates in patients with zero or one high risk cytogenic abnormality, thus abrogating the uh, increased risk of progression or death associated with the presence of single high risk abnormality. KRD plus ACT consistently led to higher rates of four-year PFS and one-year sustained MRD negativity across all the cytogenetic subgroups compared with the case KRD alone and KCD plus ACT arm. Patients with two or more high risk cytogenic abnormality had a higher risk of progression and deaths compared to the other groups. KRD plus ACT was associated with the promising results in this ultra high risk population in terms of four year PFS and one year sustained MRD negativity. Four year PFS in patients with two or more high risk cytogenic abnormality who had one year sustained MRD negativity was similar to patients with zero or one high risk cytogenic abnormality. Carfilzomib plus nerodomide maintenance reduced the risk of progression or death versus nerodomide alone, not only in patients with high-risk myeloma, but also in patients with standard-risk disease. Median PFS in patients with high-risk disease who did not receive upfront ACT was 17 months in VRD, that's in the determination trial, and 29 months in KRT, which was the Forte trial. These results support that the investigation of KRT as a backbone for multidrug regimens, including anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies in patients carrying high-risk abnormalities. KRD plus ACT consistently increases the rates of one-year sustained MRD negativity in all cytogenetic subgroups compared to KRD alone. 
So event adopting the even adopting the risk stratification by the IMWG, including all the high risk isogenic abnormality, uh, they found that PFS benefits observed with KRD plus AACT and uh, KRD plus neurodomine maintenance. Across all the treatment groups, a similar PFS between patients with low risk disease and low intermediate risk, whereas patients with intermediate high risk and high risk still showed an inferior progression-free survival. Coming on to the limitations of the study, the sample size uh, was small for each individual uh, group that reduces the power of the analysis. It does not allow to draw a definitive conclusion on the efficacy of the tested regimens in the subgroup of the patients with specific high-risk cytogenetic abnormality. Coming on to the conclusion of the study, carfilzomib-based induction, intensification, consolidation regimens produce a similar rates of PFS and one-year sustained MRD negativity with patients with one or zero uh, high-risk cytogenetic abnormality. KRD plus ASCT was more effective than KRD12, KRD alone and KCD plus ASCT in terms of PFS and one-year sustained MRD negativity across all the cytogenetic subgroups. Addition of a proteasome, proteasome inhibitor, which is carfilzomib to lenalidomide maintenance also confirmed improved PFS compared with lenalidomide alone across all the cytogenetic risk groups. Coming on to the risk of bias tool, that is the ROP2 tool, the bias uh, while arising from the randomization process, here there was almost low risk of bias because the randomization was done fairly, but it was an open label, which also goes on to a high risk of bias. Bias during, due to the deviation from the internet intervention was uh, again high risk because again here uh, the patients were aware of which uh, group they were going to randomize in. Bias due to missing out outcome data was very minimal. Bias in the measurement of the outcome was also less. So overall, the bias uh, we would say was uh, less. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pavitra. So, yeah, nice to see Dr. Lupur back. Um, yeah, so I, I'll, uh, Dr. Lupur, uh, if, it, if you allow me, shall I go ahead with my discussion and then you can yeah, come yeah. back? And I apologize for being late. I have David with me here as well. He's one of our residents. He's working with me today. Okay, nice okay. Thank you. Uh, one second, I'm just finding a little challenge in getting my presentation coming onto the screen. Yeah. Okay. So my job here is to look at in a more critic, critiquing manner from the point of critical reading to critical thinking here. So I may not be all for it, but I'm trying to find out what are the mistakes here and how we could have been biased in the whole thing. And uh, Pavitra went through the critical reading aspects. He talked about the various designs and the methodologies of the study. I'll be looking at the critical thinking from a more overarching view where how does that matter in our lives in treating, treating patients. When we critique a paper, we want to critique it for the methodology and the scientific rigor of it, as explained. And I'll be looking at the evaluating the conflict of interest, the potential biases in the publication, apart from the risk of bias in the methodologies, reviewing the interpretations of the paper and understanding the limitations and evidence to decision. This is from the, uh, the grade recommendations as we understand, how does it, how is it feasible and acceptable with the limited resources we have in India? If you look at the funding of the paper it's from Amgen, Amgen produces Kyprolis or Carfilzomib, Celigen and BMS were the, these are the three players in this funding of this paper. And we understand that BMS acquired Celigen in 2019 and they are, they are a subsidiary of BMS. So of course the interest in pushing Carfilzomib is upfront there. However, it is stated that they were not involved in the collection analysis or data interpretation or writing of the report. And then finally, they have said this is done from an academic center with an unrestricted grant. But we must understand that the way it is written down is actually to say that, okay, Carful Somib is good. Of course, nothing beyond that. Uh, so there was, it is completely funded 
and the reviewers were not paid, but uh, this was the cart uh, if you were to buy this paper online to read it. And I didn't have to go to Alexandra Ibaki and, and Dr. Pankaj was there to provide this uh, access to this paper. <laughs> this was the title of the paper. I would have said an easy and understanding title would have been a pre-planned cytogenetic subgroup analysis of phase two forte trial among the carfilzomib-based treatment in NDDM. Basically, the study is looking at the risk groups, not for carfilzomib. Carfilzomib was there for all the groups. In fact, at best, it is stating the obvious that high-risk cytogenetic abnormalities patients are going to do worse of than low risk. What are the potential biases in this paper? Salami slicing or salami publication bias is when uh, you divide a research finding into multiple smaller publications rather than presenting them as a cohesive whole. So the intent is to maximize the number of publications, give a feeling that in the academic circles that this is uh, making waves. That's the original paper, which looked at the same three molecules, a randomized open study. And uh, they showed that uh, KRD with ASAT was superior to the other groups. Of course, the best bet would have been to say that K is good, but ASCT is very important in the process. Uh, so that's the MRD negativity as a surrogate matter was uh, marker was brought in and said, KRD group would get much better MRD negativity and a sustained MRD negativity. That's a pre-maintenance analysis study design as Dr. Pavitra had just shown in a more uh, longitudinal manner is there. So basically for the viewers, we have five groups here. One is the KCD, uh, KRD alone, KCD with ASCT and KRD with ASCT. And then in the randomization, all of them are randomized into either a KR or an R group. So while they published the 2021 Forte trial, they made one statement. Subgroup analysis showed a consistent benefit of KRD, ASCT and KR maintenance in the all prognostic subgroups with similar hazard ratios in the high risk and the standard group publications. Now, what is a pre-planned subgroup analysis? And the question in my mind was, how is it different from a post hoc? We give less value to a post hoc, while a pre-planned post hoc seems to be more valid because it mitigates data dredging and data mining and probably reduces the type of narrative. It is not that something I'm seeking after the study, but I'm going to do this. Although, please understand that the power and the alpha typo and error were kept the same. However, the sample size was not determined for this particular thing, particular evaluation of high risk. So that's the sub, you know, categorization of the pre-planned subgroup versus post hoc subgroup. I wouldn't go into all of that, but in general, you would give in your mind a slightly higher weightage of a pre-planned subgroup or a pre-planned post hoc, so to speak, rather than a post hoc post-treatment, post-study. So I looked at the word pre-planned in the various original data. And that's the clinical trial.gov when they were, they had uh, registered the study and I couldn't find a word pre-planned anywhere here. And the primary outcome was based upon a VGPR. And that's the powering was done based on the VGPR. And there were multiple secondary outcomes at that time itself. And that did not have cytogenetic risk abnormalities. As Dr. Pavitra pointed out, the sample size were calculated for the VGPR, and there was a complex method analyzed in the whole thing. And uh, so, as I said, I could not find a pre planned cytogenetic subgroup analysis in the original, uh, the, the protocol which is published, which I could access. And in fact, there are many more subgroup analysis in the pipeline. So we can expect these many more studies probably coming out, reiterating the use of KRD or carfilzomib in the process. The main objective of a pre-planned study was to look at the effect of the HCRF for 0, 1, and 2, the three, do, three induction, intensification, and consolidation groups, and two maintenance groups, as we already mentioned. They also did a postdoc on the uh, staging and the R2 staging. The outcome measures were four main. OS, PFS as our uh, hard endpoints and MRD negativity and sustained MRD negativity at one year as soft or uh, surrogate endpoints. Now, this is a paper, I mean, the study which was shown by, uh, stable which is shown by Dr. Pavitra. 
and the hrs are all maintained based between the two versus one versus zero high risk study groups high risk carcinogenic abnormalities how that is only on a longitudinal basis the hr is given ideally what we would want to understand is that okay we understand this is stating the obvious two or more cytogenic risk abnormalities is worse off than zero or one that's a given that's a no brainer but that is what it is again shown here in an hr what would have been much better in this situation is among the hrca zero group what would have been the difference between them would have reiterated the statement of is kr k make is making a difference among them that would have been for me more informative than to say across the groups there was a difference so the investigators conclusions were so the standard risk was 82 versus uh, 67 the high risk was 62 versus 45 and uh, one year sustained mrd negativity was good and the maintenance every in the kr group had a better three year pfs it gives a feeling that we must use kr in all H hrca group or and then continue with that for the uh, the maintenance group let's break it down what did the study actually contribute high risk patients do worse off than low risk cytogenetics it does not matter what induction we give if the patient has high risk cytogenetics they are going to do worse off stage 3 is worse off than the stage 2 that's again a given pre maintenance sustained mrd activity can be influenced by cytogenic risk stratification fair enough zero hcra better mrd negativity two h hrca bavers mrd negativity let's look at the pharmacoeconomics of the study if i were to give krd4 and asct and krd into four it would have cost me 13 lakhs in the first year as compared to krd alone of 8 lakhs subsequently if i have to give two more years of kr that would be the cost for the six huge difference so in the critical critical thinking i would want to answer these questions in my mind should we do upfront aict myeloma in the era of novel agents should the our induction regimens what should be to prior in aict should we change the induction to double or triple it myeloma to kr should we change our post aict strategy to carfilzomib in a high risk post trial post transplant and what's the cost comparison so this is a study which looked at it and said uh, what should be the induction regimen and i'll show you this picture to say that it looked at across the study groups and found that if you look at it in one go it is looking at the vgpr cr and mrd negativity across various regimens and you can say that all of them will give almost similar groups therefore the cheapest would be the winner and that has been shown in the ifm study in the care uh, the 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 subsequently in the determination study as well after the consolidation also it is similar across the groups not much difference slightly mrd may be more in a few groups now should we change the induction regimen to triple it uh, myeloma it intuitive to know that most risk factors are worse than the less risk factors so no regimen seems to be superior to the others in the induction phase at least as recommended botlen or drd seems to be reasonable options in a double or a triple it so that means a doublet is important for maintaining them let's last few slides cost comparison between so in our mind now act is important the question is now should i use krd up front or kcd up front or vrd up front that's a cost difference if i use for a one year of an expense and if i continue with for 24 months with the strategies which is given here we would see that with 10 lakhs you can actually do a transplant do an induction and maintain this patient for 3 years with reasonable vgpr and mrd negativity in fact if you look at the determination study and compare with the other groups you will see that the vrd is in fact much better off than not much better or maybe not difference among these groups so that's a four year pfs comparison between this study and the determination study almost the same 80% four year pfs uh at the first randomization if you do that and os at the rate of four years so os and pfs not much different os of 80s and you can get and the pfs of 50 to 60s so that's the cost 
difference. And if you want to do a cost efficiency or a, uh, uh, and the study between the cost effectiveness, uh, so the difference is almost 13 lakhs between the two groups with just the MRD negativity, but not much a difference in the overall survival. There is a difference in the PFS I mentioned as 69 and 50. So it is a no brainer here, saves money and improves health. It is a, uh, it is less effect, uh, less, uh, less costly and much better off in terms of VRD. KCD, if KRD, if you want to use it is, you may have a quality, it could have been used to actually maybe to lose it. Take home, uh, as I mentioned earlier, two or more hypothyroidism risk factors do worse off than one or less. ACT is important and VRD, ACT seem to be cost effective. Not completely, totally different uh, inference from the uh, study paper which we were trying to see. So we looked at the conflict of interest, we looked at the biases, we reviewed the interpretations, looked at the limitations and what would change? My answer is that not much would change as of now. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Joseph. I love these uh, journal clubs and uh, Pavitra, you did such an amazing job. Uh, um, you know, I always learn from all of you as you all dice and uh, dissect the papers out. Part of the reason to do this is, honestly, you're absolutely right. What has this paper showed us? It showed us that high-risk disease behaves badly. Uh, we sort of know that. I think the one novelty in the paper is that the definition of high-risk is going to change. And this is the only, the Forte study is probably the only study uh, which has now included chromosome one abnormalities. Uh, Pavitra showed very nicely how we are doing uh, uh, 1P deletions and uh, chromosome one amplifications, what the cutoffs should be. And I think that's part of our learning here, uh, incorporating uh, chromosome one abnormalities in the high risk definition. We're going to have a uh, you know, we are having an IMS uh, meeting in a couple of weeks from now where we're going to redefine high-risk disease. Um, so including not just the translocations that we typically talk about, but chromosome abnormalities as well. And when it comes to chromosome abnormalities, I think it's really important to take into the cutoffs, which uh, she so nicely showed us. In terms of the design of the study, Joseph, you're so right. There's so many issues with the Forte trial. And the biggest issue that I have, one of the questions they wanted to ask was the role of transplant. And really they could not answer that question. And part of the reason why they could not answer that uh, question was, first of all, it's a phase two study, not powered enough. Uh, second of all, what it did was a re-randomization at the end of one year. And the re-randomization was for REV maintenance versus REV carpulsive maintenance. And at that time, they did not take into account high-risk features in those patients. Um, you know, the data for KRD versus VRD, uh, you all know this. I'm sure you've discussed this at this forum where Shaji uh, presented the data on uh, uh, the... Uh, What's the study called now? Uh, PRD, PRD, I'm trying to remember the name of the study. Uh, but uh, that did not show any benefit of K. Uh, that was in a transplant deferred patient uh, population. And that included patients who were older patients. And even though the response rates there were a little bit higher with KRD, I think it was the toxicity which sort of uh, washed off the benefit of KRD. Honestly, when we are thinking about the use of KRD, we would not use it in that uh, uh, patient population, which is a transplant deferred patient population. But in the younger patient population, you know, if you think about proteasome inhibitors, and I completely agree with you on the cost benefit analysis of it. But if you look at a proteasome inhibitor on its own, which one is the stronger proteasome inhibitor? Is it bortezomib or is it carfilzomib? And, you know, there is going to be more head-to-head -head comparison of KRD versus VRD within the quadruplet setting. And those are going to be more sort of cooperative group studies or EMEN studies because uh, a trial which had been presented of RVD versus KRD again 
you know, not the right patient population, transplant deferred patient population, the biggest issue with the K part of it was the toxicity. So just thinking about, and if you look at this data also, and I think you showed us really nicely, uh, you know, it's hard to compare across clinical trials, but the data for KRD versus RVD from the determination trial seemed to favor KRD, right? At least in the transplant eligible patient population. So at least for us, the way we think about this is younger, fitter patients, we want to give them the best upfront treatment. We have already moved away from three drugs. We are using four drug combinations, you know, we and we would use a KRD with a uh, monoclonal antibody. And we have data where we've used ESA KRD that will be presented at this year's ASH as well as at uh, uh, the IMS meeting. And we've seen incredibly high response rates. Again, it's a, a phase two study, so a single arm study. So you can't really draw uh, too many conclusions. But from a cost effective standpoint, uh, completely agree with you. And um, oh, should everybody be getting a transplant? I think in a resource restricted uh, uh, situation, absolutely. What we are seeing out here though, and I think the question of transplant despite the determination trial is still an, uh, a debatable question, at least in the United States, because if you look at RVD versus RVD plus transplant, sure, the transplant patients did better, but we've already moved from three drugs to four drugs. And if you look at the Griffin trial with the four drugs, we've incorporated transplant into the mix, just assuming that transplant is a standard of care. What we haven't seen is with four drug combinations, we're getting deep, deep responses in these patients. And is there a subset of patients who may not need a transplant? There's an ongoing IFM trial actually asking the question of transplant okay. again in the context of four drugs. So I think the discussion here was fantastic. I agree with you, you know, from a cost perspective, using VRD is a completely reasonable um, option and uh, transplanting patients is really important. And at least in the high risk patients or the ultra high risk patients, which is the unmet medical need, uh, if you look at this data, trying to maintain them with both a proteasome inhibitor and an imid has been sort of reaffirmed in this forte kind of look back analysis. It is a post hoc analysis, so it's not going to be, um, you know, it's not going to be as robust. And what I didn't like about this paper uh, was, you know, they showed every arm differently when they showed the PFSs. Um, they did not take into account how treatment impacted outcomes. And part of the reason why they could not do that is it's a look back analysis, post hoc analysis, you're absolutely right. Although they've said this was a pre-planned analysis, who knows if it was a pre-planned analysis. And then the subgroup, if you start cutting and dicing, your numbers become smaller and smaller, and you're not going to find any significance because this was not statistically designed to look at all of those endpoints, which you so nicely highlighted. Yes, uh, thank you. One of the questions uh, which I have in my mind is, you know, we always talk about the high risk cytogenic abnormalities and we don't talk about the presence of ploides uh, uh, in them. You know, in them you know, obviously, obviously uh, sometimes you change the risk. So what do you think that, you know, when we are talking about, when we are mentioning about the chromosomal abnormalities, should we also mention about the presence of um, ploides uh, and see uh, what uh, modification in the risk is being done by the presence of these? Yeah, so, you know, traditionally, Pankaj, we've seen that hyper, hyperdiploidy and aneuploidy, so hyperdiploidy is considered sort of standard risk, aneuploidy is considered the high risk, but you're absolutely right. When we've looked at all uh, uh, chromosomal abnormalities, we've mostly focused on translocations. We've never included uh, ploidy. Uh, I think that's one thing which we are going to talk about at this uh, meeting because with treatments, risk stratification is going to change. Uh, you remember this well, uh, you know, when we were doing the total therapy days, we used to call deletion 13 
a poor prognostic marker. And we used to be really scared of deletion 13. It's no longer even mentioned, right? So similarly, I think Cloidy needs to be looked at. And that's part of the reason why we are meeting as a group to redefine what high risk is. I don't know if you're going to include Ploidy just as yet, because not all people report on Ploidy when they uh, when you get the test. Uh, but I do think the translocations are pretty straightforward. They're there or not there, and they're there from the get-go, even from MGUS. Um, <clears throat> I think what we want to try and incorporate is this chromosome 1 abnormality, which is a real issue. And we do want us to have uh, a standardized cutoff. So what I call high risk should be the same high risk in the Porte trial, the determination trial, every trial going forward. But you're absolutely right. Aneuploidy and hyperdeploidy and ploidy should be one of the things we need to consider. Um, Dr. Nupur, can I ask a query? Okay, sure, of course. Yeah, so, so basically, I mean, I, I sometimes wonder, we, we are kind of looking at risk stratifying everybody at diagnosis. But however, some of them, even after the high risk situation or whatever, renal really failure, everything put together, at the end of four cycles, they become much better off. Now, is there a way of dynamically uh, risk stratifying based upon the response at four months and redefining your strategy rather than Basking, I mean, bucketing them in the beginning itself that you're going to be bad. Yeah, that's an um, awesome question. And that's exactly what the IFM trial is doing. You know, we've already assumed that this is sort of the standard of care for these three uh, patient uh, populations. What we are doing now is redefining how you would consolidate them, for example. Does everybody need a transplant? Does Or can we risk stratify patients to whether they need the transplant or not? And we're using tests like MRD at four months or sustained MRD at eight months. So after your initial induction treatment, we're using that. Again, the redefinition of high-risk disease also we are trying to do. So one part of the high-risk disease is this genetic risk that we are talking about today. But there's another group of patients who will have no genetic high risk and yet get their induction and their transplant and are going to relapse within 18 months. So that is a biologically high-risk patient and we just don't understand what it is that's making it high-risk. So in addition to the genetics, we're going to include this. I think using a risk-adapted strategy uh, is step number two. Once we all as a community agree upon what the correct definitions of risk would be. But I do think, uh, you know, that is the future of how we should be taking care of our patients. And it's not one size fits all for sure. So... Uh... Uh, Dr. Joseph, we actually published uh, um, a paper on the same, and we said this is a dynamic response assessment methods, DRAM. Uh, we published this in Indian Journal of uh, uh, Hematology and Transfusion Medicine. This was in 2020. And actually, we mentioned that, you know, instead of, I mean, we should do our risk certification at the time of diagnosis, but we must redefine the prognosis after uh, you know four cycles or six cycles for example in hodgkin's lymphoma we do a pet ct scan to redefine the prognosis similarly you know in non hodgkin lymphoma we do the interim pet ct scan in chronic myeloid leukemia we do the bcr abl at 3 months to redefine the prognosis so in myeloma also we should redefine by doing an mrd or at least uh, uh, um, uh, electrophoresis and uh, free light chain to see what is the response? So I just shared that paper, which we published in 2020. Sure. Yeah, I, uh, I saw that in the chat. Uh, the one only the one thing that I want to mention here is, you know, we've been burned. We've been burned. We all know Bart Barlohi data. And it's in the ultra high risk patients who actually respond quite well, right? Because their doubling time is so high. They respond well, and they're the ones, so the ones who achieved a complete response really quickly were the ones who actually did the worst. Yes. Um, so in addition to the MRD test, I do think we need to have something else for us to be better able to identify who those players are, and that would be work in progress for sure. Right. 
So six twenty. I think we can go move to the next. Uh, I don't see any question in the chat. We can move to the next. This. Uh, uh, I'm gonna sign out. Okay. Thank you so much. This Thank was you great. So much. Thank you for attending your journal clubs. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nirav, can I have the slides for the next part of the presentation? The API competition. Sir, can you see the slides? Yeah, the slides. Good. Yeah. So uh, we move to the next section of uh, the general club presentation today. That's the API competition for the month of May, and that's based on the best commentary on the journal scan article. And in fact, this was the article chosen for this month's journal scan. That was about how do you optimize land maintenance by doing an extended genetic profiling. And this was based on analysis of close to 500 odd patients in the myeloma London trial. Next slide. So to uh, put the things in the perspective of what is actually an eagle eye competition all about, uh, we have been repeating this, but I think there are definitely new uh, entries or delegates who join up. We have close to 100 odd registrations today. So the entire process uh, starts with choosing the article first. The next slide, please. Uh, then we uh, ask you to actually critically review the article. Uh, you are supposed to send us a commentary of 175 words before the due date. And importantly here, anyone who is actually having an interest in the disease that is myeloma or plasma cell dysplasia can participate. And this selection is based on uh, the commentaries uh, which we receive and they are actually assessed by a group of reviewers and definitely what a gain from it. We have certificates for you, credit hours for you and definitely vouchers for the money. So what is actually the purpose of these uh, effort? Definitely it brings you uh, abreast with the latest on plasma cell dyscrasia. You do a critical appraisal of the topic. You have refined yourself the art of scanning. You can even consider this as an opportunity to write letters to the editors. And definitely there is an international and national audience as well who reviews your slides and definitely can uh, actually present your data to them. And definitely for some of us, it becomes a matter of inter-institutional competition as well. So we analyze it based on uh, almost eight parameters, but we would request you to stick to the word limit and be succinct so that uh, you end up earning the vouchers and the certificates. So the ne uh, next slide, please. So if, uh, we have a winner uh, from Tata Memorial Center this time. Uh, he's Dr. Saswata Saha. He's an ad hoc assistant professor from the Department of Medical Oncology. Congratulations, and we'll be sending you the vouchers and uh, I would request Nirav to play the pre-recorded video of the journal scan. Good evening, respected teachers and my dear colleagues. First of all, I would like to thank Image Society for giving you this opportunity. Today in journal scan, we will be discussing the optimizing the value of nanolidomide maintenance by extended genetic profiling and analysis of 556 patients in the myeloma 11 trial. The article was published in Blood Journal on 6th of April 2023. So, in patients with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, nanolidomide is licensed maintenance therapy post autologous stem cell transplantation. The side effects associated with lens maintenance are cytopenia, vascular events, diarrhea or violation, malabsorption, and an increased risk of second malignancy. Given the continuous nature of maintenance associated with physical and psychological challenges and financial toxicity for some, its benefit for individual patients is questionable. In patients with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma were enrolled in myeloma 11 phase 3 trial and post 100 days of autologous stem cell transplantation, they were randomized to lenalidomide, lenalidomide, volinostat or observation. In this current analysis, patients randomized to lenalidomide or lenalidomide, volinostat were analyzed jointly. All the patients underwent extended genetic profiling for copy number aberrations, adverse translocation, and their co-occurrence. Based on genetic profiling, the patients were subdivided into no-hit, single-hit, or double-hit category. For all patients, myeloma tumor cells were immunomagnetically purified from baseline bone marrow using anti-CD138 antibodies. Copy number aberrations and immunoglobulin translocation were profiled using multiplex ligation dependent growth amplification and quantitative reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction. Both have been extensively validated against fluorescent in-situ hybridization. 
All the statistical analysis were undertaken using R version 4.0.5. PFS was defined as the time from the date of maintenance randomization to progression or subsequent progression for PFS2 according to IMWG criteria or death from any cause. OS was defined as the time from the date of maintenance randomization to death from any cause. Cox regression analysis was used to estimate hazard ratios and respective 95% confidence intervals. Now coming to the result, extended genetic profile are available for 556 patients and the median follow-up of the study was 51.6 months. If you look at the baseline characteristic, the median age of the population was 59 years, around 65% of the patients were male. Similarly, around 84% of the patients were uh, WHO performance status 0 and 1 and around 78% uh, of the patients had ISS uh, stage 1 or 2. So around 88% of the patients had uh, RISS uh, stage 1 or 2 and around 78% of the patients received triplet induction with CTD or CRD but they did not receive any proteasome-based uh, induction therapy. So, around 65% of patients received lenalidomide maintenance and 35% were on observation arm. So, around 62% of patients with translocation 440, 64% of deletion 1P, 57% of deletion 70P, and 45% of gain of 1Q had double hit myeloma. Double hit myeloma were most frequent in translocation 1416 or translocation 1420 tumors with the frequency of 70 percent however the numbers were too low in the total population the incidence of double hit was 17 percent and single hit were 32 percent if you look at the pre-maintenance response rate they were comparable between the three molecular risk group if you look at the survival analysis for lenalidomide maintenance lenalidomide had a significant and pfs and pfs2 advantage both were statistically significant the median PFS was 53.8 months versus 27.3 months. The median OS for lenalidomide maintenance was 80.7 months versus 78.5 months, which was numerically better but not statistically significant. If we look uh, stratify based on genomic profile, lenalidomide maintenance had biggest effect on DSS PFS in patients with single hit where the hazard ratio was 0.38 followed by patients with no hit with hazard ratio of 0.46 and followed by double hit where the hazard ratio was 0.55. So if you look at the single hit subset, lenalidomide maintenance benefited patients with deletion 1P, translocation 414 and deletion 17P, where the uh, PFS were 57.6 months versus 7.5 months, 54.3 months versus 9.9 months and 50.5 months versus 26.5 seven months however in the gain of 1q the uh, pfs were, difference were 54.4 months versus 35.1 month which was not statistically significant and there were no differential outcome in groups with either three or more than or equal to uh, four copies gain of 1q if you look at the pfs 2 and os analysis of the deletion 1p 17p and uh, translocation 414 group together so both had a uh, significant uh, PFS2 and OS advantage where PFS2 was 60.5 months versus 29.7 months and OS was not reached versus 70.8 months. If you look at the patients without any high risk lesion, the median PFS2 was not reached versus 78.5 months, which was uh, statistically significant. However, the median OS was not reached versus uh, 82.4 months and thus this was not statistically significant. If you look at the double hit subset, the median PFS was 22.5 months versus 10.6 months and the hazard ratio was 0.55 and it was statistically significant. However, the median PFS was consistently less than 24 months for all subgroup of patients with double hit as evidenced from the chart. So, the median OS uh, was 47.3 months versus 32.8 months which was not statistically significant. So the study identified for the first time a molecularly characterized subgroup of patients who derived exceptional PFS and OS benefit from LEN maintenance. The results strongly support the use of continuous LEN maintenance after ASCT in patients with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma with isolated 1P deletion, deletion 17P 
or translocation 440, which are associated with marked prolongation of PFS and OS. The study shows limited benefit of land maintenance for patients with isolated pet gain of 1Q. The data specifically highlight that comprehensive genomic profiling and correct identification of double hit at presentation is required to identify the poorest risk group. The limitations of the study are about 40, about 78 percent patient received a no proteasome based induction and they received only CTD or CRD. The maintenance PFS in the study with CTD CRD induction followed by ASCT followed by LEN maintenance was 53 months which was much lesser than that of determination trial which used a VRD based induction followed by ASCT and LEN maintenance uh, and it was 66 months. So this implies that probably with PI plus image induction LEN maintenance post ASCT might add to the PFS benefit. Stage ISS3 is underrepresented in this cohort and constituted only 22%, which is much less than Indian data of 70%. EMN 2012 recommendation tells that a cutoff for genetic cytogenetic abnormality to be considered significant is 20%. Since the study utilized MLPA and PCR, specific cutoffs for leveling a genetic abnormality as significant were not provided. The study uh, showed a median PFS of uh, 50.5 months in deletion 17P subset with lenalidomide maintenance. However, deletion 17P is a heterogeneous group and the study did not provide any positivity cutoff. Since the implication of deletion 17P positivity cannot be gauged. Meta-analysis by McCarthy et al. established lenalidomide maintenance as a standard of care in post-ASCT patient. Hence, in today's era, an ideal comparison would be TI versus lenalidomide or doublet a PI emit versus lenalidomide maintenance in high-risk myeloma rather than lenalidomide versus observation. So, LEN and LEN verinostat were analyzed jointly in the LEN maintenance cohort. The added value of verinostat to conventional LEN maintenance is unclear. The ideal analysis should have highlighted the benefit of LEN alone subgroup. And finally, the optimal duration of LEN maintenance is not defined in the study. Uh, thank you. Uh, with that, I think we'll move to the quiz time. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? The next slide. So the rules of engagement are fairly clear. Uh, we have five questions here. The two on the general club, the two on the general scan, and one on the trivia. And the fastest finger with the correct answers gets the award. So the next slide for the first question. So you are supposed to identify the trial with the design below. So you can see the inclusion criteria, the induction therapy, the post-transplant consolidation, and the maintenance cycles here. So to sum it up is DARA VRD, and subsequently the therapy follows. You can use the clues from the slide. For those of you who are used to stargazing or watching television, uh, you are supposed to identify the design of the trial is suggestive of which of these. It was the first years, the Andromeda, the Griffin, the CPS, all related to Greek mythology. And if you look at the myeloma trial, they're now based on constellations on the sky, most of them. The next two questions are going to be based on the Forte trial. The first question is, which of the following is an incorrect statement based on the findings of the Forte trial? Whether it was the rates of one year sustained MRD negativity or whether the statement was carpal plus LEN maintenance reduced the risk of progression or death versus LEN alone in high risk and standard risk myeloma. Is the PFS with transplant in patients in standard risk similar to those with KRD12? And the last one is about one year sustained MRD status negativity and PFS benefits. This question is again from the forte, and we had an important discussion with Dr. Nupur on this. Which of this, these options is incorrectly matched cutoffs for defining high risk psychogenetic abnormality positivity in the forte trial? So you must understand that every trial has specific cutoffs. So in the Forte trial, you are supposed to identify the incorrectly matched cutoff. And these are the four copy number variations and translocations you can see here. 
they're supposed to identify the incorrectly matched pattern. We must know these before we interpret the trial because otherwise we can be fooled up or baffled. The next two are going to be, uh, questions are going to be based on the journal scan which uh, Dr. Saha just discussed. Uh, as per the findings of the myeloma learning trial, you are supposed to identify the cytogenetic risk group which had the highest PFS benefit from LEN maintenance. You can see there are four cytogenetic groups which are shown here. Please identify the one which had the highest PFS benefit from LEN maintenance. You are keenly observing the graphs and the slides. I think the answer lies there. And we move to the last question. Which of the following statement or statements do you think is correct as per the findings of the trial? Len maintenance had the biggest effect on PFS in patients with single hit, followed by those with no hit and those with double hit then. The overall survival was both numerically and statistically insignificant for Len maintenance in all genetic subgroups. There is limited benefit of Len maintenance for patients with isolated 1, 2, or all the above statements too. So despite the caveats of the study, Len maintenance is going to stay for us, for most of us. At least in a large chunk of myeloma maintenance, we do. Thank you. While uh, Nirav compiles the winner, uh, let me discuss the answers with you. The next slide. So, this was the trial design which is shown here. And you can see here, and the point takeaway was, it was a quadruplet induction pitted against VRD, DARA VRD. But if you see carefully, it was subcutaneous DARA here. And all of them went through a transplant arm. And then we had post-transplant consolidations and a double maintenance and progression. And the next slide. So the correct, next slide. The correct answer is the Perseus. And for most of you who are interested in mythology, this is a god, the god who actually slain the Medusa. And you can see the Medusa head in his hand. And for those of us who knows a bit little of constellation, Perseus is a beautiful constellation which you see in the northern sky. Although the others are all Greek mythology based uh, trials, the Andromeda is with respect to amyloidosis. The Griffin had Dara VRD, but it was IV Dara. The CPS did use subcutaneous Dara, but it was in the non transplant eligible myeloma group. So the correct answer is the Perseus. The next slide, please. So this was about the incorrect statement based on the findings of the fourth age trial. The third statement is incorrect. The PFS with transplant in patients with standard risk was definitely better compared with KRD12 without transplant. Again, reinforcing the benefit of an early transplant in standard risk group again. The next slide. So this was the point which we discussed. We don't have uniformly agreed cutoffs for uh, the high-risk cytogenetic abnormality positivity. We also don't have a uniform methodology. Some people use interface based, some people use M MLPA. But for translocations, the cutoff used by the trial was 15% and not 30%. For copy number variations, it was 10%. And for amplification, amplification of one tweet was 20%. The next slide. This was obvious from the graphs which was presented. You can see the top one top graph, that is the A graph. You can see the differences. When you use a LEN maintenance in del 1P, it, is, it has the largest separation, and that is the cytogenetic subgroup which benefited the maximum out of uh, uh, LEN maintenance in terms of PFS. The last one. So this is a beautiful sum up of the myeloma 11 trial and the LEN maintenance. All these statements are correct. The LEN maintenance had the biggest benefit in those with single hit, followed by those with no hit, and then the double hits. Oh, yes, definitely, the, at least the trial didn't show that. And definitely in this subgroup of isolated, one to gain, you, you will have to look for something other than this LEN maintenance alone. Uh, Nirav, uh, do we have the winner's name? 
Sir, Dr. Dr. Rajat Pincha from TMC. Dr. Rajat Pincha from TMC is the winner. Congrats. Uh, I think we will send you the certificates and the voucher. Congratulations. Please uh, keep participating in our quest. Uh, can I have the next slide? So it's my privilege to invite you for the next month's uh, Journal Club as well. We do it every, now every month for Thursday. So that's going to be 22nd of June. And we will have Dr. Shaji joining us from Mayo. And we stick to the standard Indian time of 5.30 p.m. The next slide. And before we conclude, uh, let me express my sincere gratitude to the scientific newsletter subcommittee joins and the support uh, which we get from Pan India. The next slide from all the joins here in Myeloma. And my sincere gratitude, uh, next slide please, to Dr. Noko, who despite her busy schedule, uh, gave a very uh, violent, uh, lucid discussion on the journal club we had just presented. Thank you. I now hand over the proceedings to Dr. Joseph Long for the concluding remarks. Thank you all for joining us. And I hope it was informative. And uh, thank you, Dr. Uday and Dr. Pankaj for organizing this and supporting this incessantly. Over to Uday or Pankaj to make some remarks. My love. And, and, and thank you. Thank you to Joseph for a wonderful uh, dissection of the entire paper. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I, I think we must please. thank uh, Joseph uh, for the critical analysis uh, of the paper. In fact, uh, Joseph, as usual, has added his uh, cost effectiveness and the management and all those issues and uh, given a Indian tadka to the <laughs> to the paper. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you all. I have close to hundred attendees still logged in, sir. I don't know the completion. That will that itself shows how much people, how many people are interested in the academic. Session with you. Any, any comments? No, no, sir. Yours for the final comments. Thank you, sir. Okay. Have a great evening. Yes. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.